this video is about the first part of chapter 9 and it's about a new physical quantity called impulse. Isaac Newton didn't formulate his second law of motion or didn't write it down in terms of the acceleration. He actually rephrased it in terms of a quantity called momentum which we'll get to about halfway through the presentation. This version of Newton's second law is really useful in collisions where you have a large force applied over a short time interval. During collisions, both the object and the agent will undergo compression and then expansion. It's inevitable when any solid surface has a large force applied to it. That makes the force is exchanged between the object and the agent proportional to the amount of compression and therefore proportional to the time that the two things are in contact with each other. This means that we have a really complex functional relationship between force and time that makes analysis difficult unless we introduce this quantity impulse. So here is one of our smart cards and you can see that the right end has been fitted with a spring. What would happen when the cart and the spring interact with that end stop there? The reason I'm using a spring is to make the compression visible. Normally with solid objects it would be microscopic and you wouldn't be able to see how much compression is. So what I want you to do now is to pause the movie Think about the force that's going to be applied to the cart by the end stop and then make a graph of that versus time. Does your graph look like this? This is an actual recording of that cart with that spring bumping into the end stop. And you can see that the time um, of, they were in, interacting with each other is only about eight tenths of or eight hundredths of a second and the force has a complex shape so it rises reaches a maximum and then comes back down to a minimum while the force is increasing that is while the spring is being compressed while the force is decreasing that is while the spring is expanding and right at the very peak, just shy of four hundredths of a second, that is where the cart was at rest for an instant. So whenever the, during a collision, whenever the force is at its maximum value, then the object is at rest and it's between compressing and expanding back. So how do we calculate this new quantity or define this new quantity impulse from this graph? Impulse is defined to be the area underneath a force versus time graph. So I've shaded that in with the area tool and capstone and you can see it's about 0.27 Newton seconds. Newton second would be the unit of impulse because the vertical axis of that area is going to be Newtons the horizontal axis is going to be time in seconds usually. In calculus we use an operation called the integral to find the area underneath the curve. In this situation that would be very difficult to do even if we did know a lot of calculus because that curve doesn't really follow any well-defined functional shape that we could integrate. So instead what we would do is approximate techniques like capstone does to find the area or we can define something called the average force. Now this average is not an arithmetic mean. We're not just adding up a bunch of numbers and dividing by the number we're adding together. This way of defining average says that the average force is the one that if constant over the same delta t would give us the same area. So I've drawn that here as the light blue rectangle on the graph. You can see its value is about three and a quarter newtons. 
and the vertical height of that rectangle was chosen so that the blue shaded area in the rectangle is equal to the red shaded area underneath the curve. So that's how average force is defined. So what that means is instead of doing the integral that you see over here to the right, what we can do is the much simpler multiplication of F average times delta T. And that non-integral version is what we'll use in class. Now you'll notice that since impulse is determined from force, that means it's going to be a vector. The only difference between impulse and force is multiplication by a time interval. So what that means is that the impulse vector is parallel to the average force vector. So how is this connected to Newton's second law? Here we start with Newton's second law. Acceleration is equal to the average force divided by the mass. We break down acceleration as change in velocity per unit time. We do a little cross multiplying, and so we get m times delta v is f average delta t. And remember that f average times delta t is equal to the impulse. Then in the final line over there, we have taken the delta v and distributed the m into it. And remember that deltas are always final minus initial. So this quantity m times v looks interesting also because it is connected directly to impulse. And that quantity m times v is called momentum. We typically abbreviate momentum of a single object with a lowercase p and there's its definition over in the left column, p is equal to m times v. That means p is a vector that is parallel to the velocity. This suggests that we have another way of defining Newton's second law. Previously, we've been talking about it as a net force is required to produce an acceleration. But an equally valid way of thinking about this is to say that a net force is required to change the momentum of an object. And the impulse supplied by that net force is equivalent to the change in momentum. I have italicized change there because it's important because impulse is not equal to momentum. Impulse is equal to change in momentum. In the language of calculus, this is what Newton's second law looks like. F net is equal to dp dt. This is actually the way that it is written out in Newton's physics books. He didn't really talk about acceleration. That came later when other people started using his discoveries. This version of Newton's second law is often referred to as the momentum principle. A net force is required to change the momentum of an object. So summarizing, impulse and momentum are vectors. Impulse is parallel to the net force. Momentum is parallel to the velocity. If you think about momentum, it appears to have units of kilograms times meters per second, mass times velocity. But since change in momentum is equivalent to impulse, it really should have units of newtons times seconds. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to show that those two units are actually equivalent. Pause the video and work on that for a few minutes. Okay, hopefully you were able to show that impulse and momentum have the same unit. Another way of expressing that, quant that fact that change in impulse is equal to, excuse me, change in momentum is equal to impulse is to express it in the equation that I've shown there, where the final momentum is equal to the initial momentum plus the impulse. So with these two vectors drawn out, initial momentum and impulse, what would the final momentum look like? Take a few seconds and sketch this out in your notes and see if you can predict what is going to happen. What does the final momentum vector look like? 
This is what the final momentum vector would look like in this scenario, shown here in red. The final momentum is the sum of the initial momentum and the impulse, so it's drawn there in red. Here's another scenario. I have an initial momentum vector and a final momentum vector. What does the impulse vector look like? Hit pause and try to sketch out what you think the impulse vector would look like in this case. Here's the impulse vector. Impulse is change in momentum, which means final momentum minus initial momentum. So I've drawn it there as the blue impulse vector. Now going back to the momentum principle, what this tells us is to accomplish a given momentum change, there are many options on how to do it. One way to accomplish a given delta P would be to have a really long delta T but with a very small force. So we'd have a short wide graph giving us a large area. We could do it the other way around however and we could use a tall skinny graph with a high average force and a short delta T. Each of these has different benefits and drawbacks. Um, So here are some smart cart collisions. The top half of each graph is showing the force from the sensor, and the bottom half of each graph is showing the momentum, the product of the mass and the velocity measured by the cart. And we have four different runs here. Run four, you can see, has a very short delta T, only about a hundredth of a second, and a large average force. Now you'll notice in this scenario that the initial momentum was positive and the final momentum is negative. So that means our delta P is negative. If our delta P is negative, then our impulse must be negative. Since delta T's are always positive, that means that we must have a negative force function. So the force was pointing opposite of the direction of the initial momentum vector in order to change the momentum from positive to negative. So you can see that the delta t's vary quite a bit from a hundredth of a second out to nearly a tenth of a second for run seven. What's changing the delta t is the flexibility of the bumper on the front of the cart. Run four was done with a hard rubber bumper, like a pencil eraser. Run five was done with a spring bumper that had a small spring constant. Oh, excuse me, that's backwards. Run five was done with something that was had a large spring constant. Run six was done with the low spring constant. So it compressed more and gave us a smaller average force. And then run seven was actually done with magnets so that they repel each other over a very large distance, leading to a very long interaction time. So here's a smaller version with some questions for you to think about. Which one of those runs had the most compressible bumper? Which one had the least compressible bumper? Pause the video, think about that, write some things down in your notes. There'll be a worksheet accompanying this movie and I want to set you up for that by asking you a couple of questions. If you watch comedy movies when there's a car crash, the airbags typically inflate in the passenger's face and then stay that way. That's not actually how they work. 
They have vents in the side of them, kind of like Velcro, so that when the occupants bump into the airbag, those vents open and the bag deflates. Why do you suppose that the airbags actually let the air out when somebody runs into them? Airbags are very effective at preventing serious injuries in car accidents. How? Why are they so effective at preventing serious injuries in car accidents? And then, of course, to tie this all together with physics, what does this have to do with impulse and momentum? So think about those questions as you start the worksheet.